Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to the 23rd Hong Kong Forum, co-organized by the Federations of Hong Kong Business Associations Worldwide and the Hong Kong Trade Development Council. This forum is a celebration event of the 25th anniversary of the establishment of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Before we start, may I remind all participants of the followings. Today's sessions will be conducted in English. Simultaneous interpretation in Japanese and Putonghua will be provided. Please reach out to our colleagues at the reception counter for a headset if needed. For online participants, you may switch to your preferred language underneath the video screen. If you would like to pose any questions to our speaker during Q&A, please scan the QR code in front of you to submit your questions. For online participants, you may also send your questions through the Q&A box on the right side of the video screen. Selected questions will be addressed at the Q&A towards the end of each session. Today's program will start with the thematic session of Economic Outlook of Mainland China. From the pandemic disruption, progress of global recovery to international trade tensions, the world's sustainable growth is hinged on the global dynamics and new economic drivers. In Asia, the recent implementation of LCEP agreement and the rapid development in innovation and sustainability have boosted continuous regional growth and fostered new collaboration among the economies in Asia, including mainland China. Business leaders and experts will share their insights and dissect China's new growth area and challenges ahead in the post-pandemic era. Today, we are delighted to have Ms. Arina Fan, Director of Research Hong Kong Trade Development Council to moderate the session for us. May I invite Ms. Arena Fan to join us on stage. We are also pleased to have three renowned experts with us this afternoon. They include Mr. Chang Ka Moon, Senior Advisor, Fong Business Intelligence and Managing Director, Li Yen Fong, Development China Limited. Mr. Adam Kwok, Executive Director, Sun Hong K Properties Limited. <laughs> Mr. Peter Mock, Head of Greater Bay Area, Hong Kong Science and Technology Parks Corporation. Arena, may I now pass the time to you? Thank you, Kiko. Um, so, a uh, very um, welcome to all from those in this room to join this afternoon's um, uh, uh, afternoon program, and also welcome to those uh, from uh, our good friends dial in from online. So, um, yesterday, uh, I think there was a discussion was among the regional opportunities amidst you know, the kickstart of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, earlier this year. Today, we zoom into the largest economy in Asia, China. So there seems to be quite some challenges. Well, from the headlines, for instance, we know that China's overall GDP growth appears to be quite slow, um, about 3% in the first three quarters. Nevertheless, some bright spots have been under notice. So if we look deeper into the GDP component, for instance, um, actually the um, advanced manufacturing sector grew by 8.5%, which is you know, just 3% of the headline growth. And also in terms of investment, you know, today we have our representative from the property sector, right? Um, Adams here. So in terms of say the uh, Chinese uh, property sector investment, often the decline in the property sector investment was on news headline. But indeed, if you look at the overall fixed assets investment in China, it grew by 5.8% in the first 10 months. Well, advanced manufacturing investment actually increased by 23.6%, and of which advanced medical equipment investment expanded by about 28%. So 
Um, well, I think it's easy to overlook the opportunities when you know all the um, focus seems to be on the challenges. So the world is in transition, well, so as China, to adapt to a new normal or the next normal, which is driven by innovation and sustainability. So today, we are very happy to have three business leaders who all have very rich experience of doing business in China. And to share with us, how do they see where the Chinese market is heading, and as well as their respective business plan in China. So, um, Mr. Chang, so close to me. So, um, I would like to invite Mr. Chang to share with us, you know, his insight about how Chinese um, economic outlook and uh, the, uh, evolving in the short term and, you know, uh, also in the long term after pandemic. And as well as, you know, um, today we, you know, we're still wearing masks and today very happy to have you, even we have the zero um, plus three, which is quite flexible. But what about in China? How does the zero COVID policy affecting the global supply chain? And what are the advice or solutions that you suggest to overseas companies, especially the SMEs, to tackle the situation? I know Mr. Chen he brought with us a few slides to try to address these two questions. Over to you, Mr. Chen. to use it. Thank you, Arena. Uh, dear audience and those uh, friends from online, uh, it is my great pleasure to give a presentation uh, regarding uh, the economic outlook of the mainland China and also trend in the post-pandemic supply chain. Um, I, I, it is actually an impossible task because I'm only given 15 minutes to accomplish this uh, task. Therefore, the best and smart way for me to do so is to provide you with a PowerPoint. And uh, I, I will just, you know, try to pick some important point for you to consider. Now, uh, the first thing is about the economic outlook uh, of China. So uh, just as uh, Irina has just mentioned, there are some silver lining. But overall, I, I have to say that Chinese economy suffer for a slowdown. The forecast is that the growth of GDP this year will be around 3%. Of course, next year will be better. The consensus will be around 45 to 5%. But I would really love to say that the problem is actually mainly from outside. That is the tightening and uh, monetary policy and inflation worldwide, and there is a slow global, slowing global economy. Now, this is the major challenges encountering China for the past, I would say, maybe five years, starting from 2018. That is the US and China trade confrontation. Now, uh, in the year 2021, uh, we can say that uh, maybe spe especially this year, that is China is also severely affected by the, uh, the and other resurgence of the COVID-19. Now, so these are the two major factors. The first is a slowing global demand, mainly external challenges. And the second is internal, that is the COVID issue. So that's uh, the two major reasons why China has suffered from an economic slowdown. Now, the, from, the, from the short term, uh, the Chinese government adopted the anti statistical policy, mainly fiscal policy, that is they try to encourage more investment. And the second is, of course, monetary policy. It is quite prudent, it is quite cautious in the sense that they want to ensure sufficient liquidity. It means that they especially want the real economy to get necessary loans from the bank. So it is always the strategies of the government to adopt short-term fiscal and monetary policy to tackle an economic slowdown. So, so this is the major issue, yeah, what, what they are doing. And um, other than that, uh, we can see that uh, just uh, for maybe today, we see a lot of new policy 
regarding to release the very restrictive COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So there is a 20 optimized measure for combating COVID-19. And uh, specifically, there is new financing measures trying targeting the real estate sectors. So uh, these are the two major new development. Okay, so but the first one is much, much more important, the relaxing of the very restrictive COVID pandemic policy. Now this is all short term, all short term. But from the long term, I would say that it is uh, more promising. For example, according to the 20th Party Congress, Chinese government emphasized the importance of growth, especially the high quality growth. Um, the thing is that they can only do it to counter the very weakened global, uh, global demand. And also another issue the Chinese government is doing is look at national security. Now from an economic perspective, it is related to technology, supply chain, and the supply of energy and other critical inputs. More importantly is that in the 20th Party Congress report, Chinese government reiterate the importance of reform and opening up. Now we always heard a term called bill circulation. That is the importance of the domestic demand together with external circulation, that is the global demand. There are a lot of you know, worry that whether China will close its door. I think that it is um, not the case. Xi Jinping repeatedly emphasized that we need a domestic economy to help enhancing the interplay between domestic and the international flow of resources. They really wanted strategies to expand the domestic market so that more foreign business person will think that it is more necessary for them to invest or export to the China market. So I think that the emphasis on the domestic economy is necessary for China to further attract more foreign investment. So um, I, I would say that in the long term, there are lots of opportunity uh, in China, but I won't uh, go into details, the long term, yeah. Um, let me see. Oh, yeah. The first is that uh, we should pay more attention to the outset because the outset is an area of which you can concentrate into other countries' market more easily, and then uh, you can have a more generous definition of value added. It means that if you, know, you source from other countries, 40% of your products are sourcing from other countries, then you can get almost free access to the markets. And more importantly, it is an area which, of which you can also do research quite easily. And the other opportunities is involving innovation and uh, pay specific attention to the service sectors. Now the service sectors account for just half of the China GDP, but the target will be 70% of the whole uh, GDP. So there are plenty of room to develop. And uh, the China economy will be rebalancing towards consumption from investment. So there will be more consumption. Consumption, you know, it is more, I would say, fundamental than the investment. So Chinese government emphasize the development of a huge domestic market, emphasizing consumption. I think this is a very good sign for those who want to develop their business in China. Another issue is uh, pay attention to urbanization. Urbanization, I would say, is the most single important factors that contribute to our confidence of China's development. If there is urbanization, it means that they will have continuous huge demand 
for, for a lot of uh, factors of production resources in China. So I would say that there is a huge demand for urbanization. So um, this is uh, my take on the um, long-term development of China. So in short, when I want to conclude about my observation about the Chinese economy is that in the short one, yes, I, I think we have to face the reality that there is a challenge of a slowing economy in the short one. However, the Chinese government is smart enough to adopt those anti statistical policy in the area of fiscal and monetary to counterbalance the downturn. However, in the long run, I think that I'm quite confident because uh, they understand the importance, well, only five minutes left. So better leave, so, so better leave the, the slide to you. Yeah. So, so you, can, you can get the slide. Uh, so um, uh, and, and in the long run, I, I, I think that you know, they are smart enough to understand the importance of innovation and urbanization is really a main driver of the economy. Now, there are trends on the global post-pandemic supply chain. I won't go into big de great details, but I just want to tell you that the uh, pandemic really reshaped the whole supply chain globally. Now, in the year 2021, because China is so successful in containing the, the, the COVID, therefore it, be, it actually stabilized the global supply chain. But the situation changed this year, it became a great disruption. Therefore, the response of the global business community is that they are more sure about a China plus one policy. Now, I would say that China is still an indispensable source of supply chain, especially in upstream. They control the material components. They have very, very strong economic clusters management, as well as a lot of technology in the supply chain. So they are very, very important. However, in order to avoid all those tax imposed by other countries, you know, a lot of businessmen has to face the reality and to source outside of China. However, China will still be very important in that particular product they control, the upstream, however, the final stage of production will be in a country that has no trade dispute with the developed world. And the second issue you have to pay attention is geopolitics. And the third one, this is a very interesting, let me see, oh no, this one. This one, very important. There are lots of new multilateral trading system and free trade agreements in the world. Now, one is the, the, the RCEP, we know the RCEP, and this another one is the US lead Indo Pacific Economic Framework. Now, this is uh, in the middle of the, of, the, of the table. Now, this one is very interesting. Actually, it's quite, I, I would say that it is actually identical to RCEP, only China is not involved in the Indo one, substituted by USA and India. It is a bad news. But I will say that every you know, country understands the importance of FTA. And um, another issue impacting on the trend of the supply chain will still be the cause of the, of the labor. That is the fourth one. And the third, fifth one will be the response of the sourcing country, the, their, their policy. I, I won't go into details. However, one very, very important issue that has impact on the global supply chain is actually the market. For example, a lot of people trying to relocate outside of China, at the end of the day, they decided to stay in China, mainly because they want to concentrate into the Chinese market. So China, the market, will be very, very uh, important. And, and, and the last thing, I, I won't go into details, a lot of suggestion. Uh, please uh, 
uh, pay attention to the dual circulation policy, especially in the area of digitalization and innovation. It is important for you to choose the right location to develop your business in the mainland of China. China is too big, too diverse. You can't say that you have a China policy. It's very difficult. Please look at the city clusters and the metropolitans. So this is the main major area. And please understand what's going on about the government. So pay special attention to government policies. So I think I, I exceed the time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chang. Um, so um, as the moderator, um, I would like to add a little bit and then uh, do some exercise with the four, because uh, that is a very, um, very mo uh, important moment that we have so many visitors from foreign uh, different countries on the four. So I would have to disagree with uh, Mr. Chang a little bit about the short term challenges for uh, China's economic slowdown. Before I discuss why, I would like to ask the four to give me a little bit of information. May I have uh, the hands up if you are from North America? Okay, good. And then may I have some fours up if you're from Europe? Very good. And then any, the others are from the Asian markets? Okay, great. So we had almost one third of each. So um, just would like to tell you some great and you know, not so great news. When Mr. Cheng uh, talked about, you know, the market consensus is about, you know, China's economic growth for next year is about 4.5 to 5 percent. Doesn't sound very exciting, right? From those from the North America, if you look at the U.S. market, IMF's forecast for uh, U.S. 2023 grows 1 percent. Okay, and then uh, for for Europe, um, 0 0.5, and unfortunately, Germany and Italy will be in recession. Oh, and then for ASEAN, well, this will be uh, one of the fastest growing markets in the world. So I would say, put it into the context, we can still see that, you know, among all the big economies, everybody faced the same challenge. You know, so down in the global demand, I mean, China is not an exception, but I think including all of the major economies. Um, but the good news is that we can still, you know, um, opportunities and fast growing opportunities still in the region. And I do agree with, you know, Mr. Cheng about, you know, identify some of the key uh, long-term drivers that we're still very long-term positive about China. Uh, I mean, despite, uh, you know, the geopolitical tension, I really like uh, Hans, uh, you know, uh, uh, speech at the lunch and say, you know, geopolitical tensions are reality, whether you like it or not, right? But then we can also see that it's more, you know, regional collaboration, uh, you know, to, to, to give birth to more regional collaboration because of that. So that will be also something good for people in this um, room to uh, also those from online to really look at the opportunities here. And the other thing is about, you know, uh, 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 also definitely will be a long-term stimulus to the growth of the region. And the other thing, you know, uh, Mr. Cheng uh, mentioned about is urbanization. Okay, when we talk about urbanization, today we talk about a lot of smart cities, smart infrastructure, smart constructions, right? That brings me to our next speaker, Adam. Okay, because Adam, you know, uh, the Sanghong K property is Hong Kong's largest developer by market value and has been investing in China for many years. And as the Chinese economy is, you know, everybody say is suffering from weakening demand, and you know, how is the market evolving within this crossfires from your view? Okay, thanks, Irina. Uh, first of all, hi everyone. Um, I'm told that uh, I could take off my mask if I did a PCR today, so I just did one. So perfect timing. Can you hear me loud and clear. I understand a lot of you from different uh, business associations around the world, and um, I think your your question is my my outlook in China, right? And I think. In short term, everyone's question obviously is on zero COVID, right? What is, what is dynamic zero? Is China going to pivot away from it? And uh, where are we at? I think, uh, I think you've come at the right week where you see a lot of progress. I think uh, if you follow the news these two weeks, I think, um, I think, I think f fundamentally, I think the party, the Communist Party will get it right. Uh, why do I say that? I think there's six conditions. You, you think about it, and this is not just me listing it. I, I've you know, studied the speeches, you studied the, the state council, a lot of experts, and say, there's basically six conditions you need for China to return to normalcy, right? For such a huge population. And first of all, 
it is, is the government going to constantly adapt and evolve with its responses? Is it going to be one size fits all, or are they going to adapt and respond? I think that we're seeing this week and these two weeks especially that the party is pro progressing fast on this. Number two, we'll have to see if there is a relatively fully vaccinated population and with the new generation of vaccines, right? Um, I think we all know that the first generation vaccine has its weakness and that uh, the virus has evolved and that the vaccination drive in China has yet to be improved. And even if you study the rhetoric, um, over eight, uh, the age over 80, the um, vaccination for boosters is only 40%. Obviously, for two shots, they're around 65%, and that has yet to be improved. And if you look at the statements yesterday by the state council and, you, and also the um, 20 new policies on it, you will see there's a big drive now to boost vaccination. And it is not only the first generation, but the second generation vaccines that are homegrown. Of course, there is also the BioNTech mRNA one, but there's also the CanSino ones and others. And the Chinese governments are really going all out to boost the, the vaccination among seniors. Number three, you need to see is there enough hospitals and is there enough ICU beds? And is the effort being put in um, the uh, Fong Chong, which is, is the effort being put in isolation facilities or is it being put in curing heavy ICU and in need medical cases. You can see from the news, and there's um, more and more rhetoric about it, the, the, the government hasn't announced anything yet, but you can see more and more attention is being focused on actual treatment facility instead of just isolation facility. And I think that's a positive sign. I think number four you have to see with zero COVID is the research on drug and vaccines. And are we continuing it? Are we going to adopt nRNA? Are we going to welcome, and, and while we grow our home champions, are we also going to wel welcome uh, BioNTech? And obviously, we all see the German ch uh, chancellor coming to China, and then uh, we, us welcoming them. You see, the, again, the homegrown vaccines by a few companies that are very, very promising, right? It's some you don't even have to inject. You just have to inhale through your nose. Um, number five, you have to look at if the local governments have enough PP&E and regular supply of uh, healthcare workers. I don't think that's a problem. And at the end of the day, number six, you have to see that the lockdowns, are they becoming more and more precise? Are they becoming more and more targeted? Or are they just uh, one, like, like Shanghai back in the days, um, you know, one, uh, one, one blanket lockdown? And I think we all know that, especially if you look at Guangzhou, I think Guangzhou in a way has been a trailblazer. They have adopted a very precise, a very scientific lockdown. I have a lot of business in Guangzhou and I can tell each District is, is, is one district varies from another, and there is no total lockdown. And even within a district, they are very precise with what they lock down and what they quarantine. It can go as finite as a few building blocks only, or even a few floors. And in fact, once there's no cases in the, in the, in the little district, they, they, re, they, they relax it right away. And then today, if you read the news, you know that Guangzhou has announced among a few policies they will pilot um, home quarantine for close contacts. I think that's a huge move. And I think what you have to see is if Guangzhou does home quarantine and does it well, then that means there's less need for Fong Chong, the, the, the isolation facilities, and also that means the other cities going to follow. If we can prove a path that Guangzhou has effectively uh, prevented any death at all, right? Zero COVID also, most importantly, the priority is human lives first for, for, for our national policy. And if we have in Guangzhou, despite you know, uh, a few hundred thousand, uh, actually 40,000, actually more, more cases accumulated. If we have prevented near zero death, I think that is also a big KPI we can look at. And so all these signs, if you ask me about China economy in short term, I think all these signs says that um, while the party, of course, we, our top priority is protecting lives, I think our road to normalcy will eventually get there and that there are a lot of uh, promising signs coming ahead. So. Um, that, that's my uh, short-term read. I think that's low-hanging fruit on China economy, right? You, you get less lockdowns, you get the economy going, then you really get a dual circulation going. Um, another promising sign in uh, medium term is you look at the popular, popularity of President Xi, Xi in the G20. I think he's the most popular guy, right? He goes, every, every country leader wants to be with him, you know, maybe except for the, the, the UK prime minister for whatever his reason is. But, you know, he's basically, everyone wants a bilateral meeting with him and he's, he's busy, uh, you know, to the T with every meeting, and then there's promising signs, and that means every country is keen in um, you know re re resuming bilateral relationship with China, and that we still have good friends and good soft power. And the most important thing is, is as long as we can, you know, maintain a healthy competition with other countries while seeking areas of cooperation and not touching each other's red line and putting guardrails around it, 
then I think um, that is a promising way forward in the new era. Thanks. Thank you, Adam. I think uh, what Adam uh, would conclude would be like, just like today, right? You came here, you have experience, right? You have a very positive experience, and during the lunch, many of you told me that actually it's exceed your expectation when you come back to Hong Kong. So what Adam tried to tell you is that from his business in China, although today you could not go across the border, but actually don't always to focus on the negative headlines <laughs> that, you know, about Chinese uh, COVID policy. Actually, uh, the business, uh, they do see, uh, you know, the uh, government strike a balance between the impact between the policy and the I impact on, on the business. So, so let's cross our fingers and then, you know, look forward to soon we could, you know, cross the border to get into China. So um, getting to something more about uh, Song Hong Kong. So many economists or analysts say that, you know, Greater Bay Area is an important growth engine for mainland China. And Adam, could you share with us more about your international commercial center projects in Guangzhou and Nansha? And what is your master plan, you know, in the, in the border Greater Bay Area? Well, can Hong Kong and other regional economies take part in, you know, the process of this, you know, very promising economic growth of GBA? Thanks. Uh, let me give a little background on my company, Songkai Properties. We 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 are one of the first generation since the seventies involving in the urbanization of Hong Kong. Obviously, um, there's a lot of rural areas, a lot of new towns back in Hong Kong that that we were a big part of in transforming. Um, we followed the government. We built a lot of new homes and a lot of new towns, and also a lot of new malls. Eventually, you know, we progressed to this time. We also have, um, you know, um, on top of residential projects, we have uh, mixed use of commercial offices, you know, hotels, malls, and that have become really not just the high-end, high-end stuff like you look at in uh, IFC or ICC in West Kowloon, but really the regional hubs and the, and the centers you see that uh, we're all very proud of in contributing to Hong Kong. So we've, we've, put that, we've, we've migrated that story to China. For us, I, I want to explain what we're trying to do in China first before I zoom into GBA. And if you look at the 20th plenum speech, National Congress speech. I, I'm very moved by a few words. One is that they have said that China will continue to open up the markets, especially in areas where demand has not been fully met. And then you look at the Vice Premier Lo He, he actually specifies these areas. He says that these areas and these markets include quality branded merchandise, wellness industry, professional high-end services, like design, innovation, accounting, auditing, of course, a lot of uh, IT and hard tech companies. So these areas are not only relevant to me, but all of you here. And that's where China is very pragmatic and they will continue to open up expression areas and invite foreign expertise to come in. And so for us, we are aspiring to be a city commercial operator in, in the new era. We, 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 in, and, and we are very selective with the cities, right? We want to bring the few industries that um, blossoming in China, that the, meet, uh, that the demands are yet to be met into our ecosystem, and we want to uh, grow them in the first tier cities. So our history in, um, uh, we have around 50 million square feet of uh, commercial properties in China. They are all in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and uh, Nanjing, and so on. And we aim to double that. We aim to double that in the next four or five years. We hopefully get to 30 million square feet. And that in these projects, you will find that they will have domestic and international brands like you guys. They will have international headquarters. They will have tenants, retail tenants. And they will have a lot of areas where the economy demand is yet to be met. And we really want to bring them in. We really want to bring you guys and a lot of brands in to China so that you could meet the demands of your customers. And we want to integrate you guys from offline to online. And, and we, have the, we have the success case in Shanghai, like IFC, like IAPM to show it. We have the success case in Guangzhou and with the success case in Beijing. So then I will zoom into GBA. You look at what the 20th National Congress has said. I think it's very important in real estate to talk about location. They said exactly, 20th National Congress says, they have to leverage the role of city clusters and metropolitan areas to promote coordinated development of large, small, and medium cities. Basically, they're saying city clusters and metropolitan areas are the key area to focus on. The second thing they talk about in GBA is President Xi has said, GBA is on the rail. That basically means that you want to build a GBA that's connected by railways. And so for me to look at it, 
I look at the city clusters, I want to be in the clear winner in the cities where I think it's going to win. And, and to me, it's either Guangzhou or Shenzhen and GBA. And so I am, um, so in the past few, few years, we have strategically placed bets in, uh, in the GBA cities. In 2019, we have won a site in Guangzhou and Nansha, which is along the, um, uh, uh, um, the, the, the high-speed train station from Hong Kong to Shenzhen to Guangzhou. And then 2019, at, at the time when Hong Kong was most turbulent, we put 40 billion Hong Kong dollars, the land price only, into the West Kowloon um, high-speed train station. If you guys had time to go to, I understand yesterday you went to the West Kowloon Cultural District, you will see the high-speed train station there, which is connected to all of China, which is where President Xi came in July 1st. So on top of that, we put 40 billion Hong Kong dollars into building a new city center and a new office building there. And then in 2021, we placed a big bet on uh, Guangzhou in the high-speed station there, station there, which is 47 minutes away from Hong Kong. It's called South Station. It's going to be another ICC we hope to build there. And so why do I say all this? We're, we're betting that on the railway and the most strategic cities in, in GBA, which is Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and uh, Guangzhou, connected by railway, within one hour, within one hour, we think we can have a lot of synergy. Within one hour, we can travel to all these nine cities, nine plus two cities by rail, and that a lot, lot of the regional GBA headquarters are going to want to be, be there. They want to do a day trip, maybe to Shenzhen, and then afternoon meeting in Dongguan, and then at night come back to Hong Kong. They can all do it within one hour in, in these city clusters. You go to West Kowloon and ICC, you want a back office or you want a professional service in Guangzhou, you want to talk to the staff in morning meeting, you can get on the speech, train station and go there. And so my, my goal is that along this railway in this city cluster, I can cover all you guys. So that's our strategy. Thank you. Thank you. you know, uh from Adam's sharing of his business plan, and as well as the way his enthusiasm, you can see the optimism about his China business, right? So uh, let's move on. You know, uh, we, we talk about in China, there are two, uh, one of the things uh, I mentioned about is the advanced manufacturing, right? The sector is really about smart and technology, right? Today, we're also very happy to have Peter um, to share with us. So um, actually, uh, I have a few questions for him, and then uh, he will also try to resolve with the build slides. The question for you, Peter, is really, China has become one of the rising stars of the global uh, innovation and has developed ground uh, breaking advance in key sectors such as AI and e-commerce. And the Chinese government also consider innovation to be one of the key drivers of its future growth. I think uh, 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 Mr. Chang also mentioned about that, right? Then how do you think Hong Kong's road as an innovation and technology hub can really contribute to, to China's further development? And you know, how uh, the, uh, the tech ventures can really capture the opportunities? I know there are some startup participants you know, on the floor. They are keen to know. And um, uh, and also GB is uh, you know as uh, you know uh, Adam have shown is such a you know exciting area for development and uh, a lot of a mega scale economic powerhouse in the region and you know uh, Hong Kong's science and technology port has established a branch office in Shenzhen. Uh, and uh, 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 food uh, to foster the innovation and technology collaboration between uh, the two places. So could you please tell us more about the plan? We really want to know about the details. Okay, thanks, Thank a, thanks a lot for your question. And uh, uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you all to Hong Kong. And I understand that uh, uh, this morning, uh, maybe all or some of you have been visiting Science Park. Welcome again. I hope you like the, your visit. You can see something uh, there which is quite a bit different from your way, where, where you always go, like Central uh, or the Central Business, business Districts. So about Hong Kong, we are famous as an international finance centre. Right, uh, a tourist hub, a logistics centre. But about innovation and technology, you know, we are not that famous. So I would like to share about where we are in terms of technology, and also we're working very closely with our, with the mainland. So I mean, let's see what's the position of Hong Kong and China and other cities. So my first slide, I draw some statistics or survey from the Global Innovation Index 2022. So you can see that this is the ranking of uh, 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 countries or, or, or regions ar around the world in terms of innovation and technologies. Okay, and you can see that uh, the ranking of China is actually uh, in the forefront uh, of the, of the uh, whole world. It's actually ranked number 11th. And where's Hong Kong? 
Hong Kong is not bad, 14th. So we're still in the, on, on top 20 of the league table. So out of these top 20 uh, countries, you can see that five of them are from the Asia Pacific region. So uh, was the South Korea on the top of the list, followed by uh, China, Japan, and Hong Kong. So I mean, uh, actually in the whole Asia, the innovation technology market is, going, is growing very uh, aggressively, I have to say that. So even Hong Kong, as a famous financial city, we are actually catching up. So actually, uh, in the past few years, we, we are also working with other counterparts like our you know, other financial centers like London, New York, Tokyo. All of these cities are actually not just focusing on finance and business, but also innovation and technologies. Say, for example, in terms of fintech, London and, and actually Edinburgh is doing very well, very well. So I, I think in terms of innovation and technology, uh, we are on the dig table, okay? And there's a second slide from the same uh, survey. I, I'll try to draw the uh, China and Hong Kong. You can see China is actually picking up. In 2013, China's ranked 35 in the world. And now it's picking up, actually overtakes Hong Kong. So I think together uh, 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 the, with the mainland, uh, uh, Hong Kong and, Ch and China together, I think we can have a very strong complementary value. Why I say we have a strong complementary value, I want to share with you the same study, okay? How they rank these uh, uh, global rankings by seven different parameters. In the first two I, uh, I circle it, it's actually about the uh, comparative advantage uh, uh, of Hong Kong, uh, which is the institutions including the, our legal system, the po political environment, regulatory and business environment. The other very strong point compared to China is the market, so market sophistication, including the credit, the investment, trade diversification, and all these uh, um, uh, areas. But how about China? So you can, see in this, in, you can see in this circle. In terms of China, it's very strong in the business so sophistication. So in terms of knowledge, uh, um, uh, workers, they do have a lot of engineers, so many universities. In terms of knowledge impacts, they're very good in commercialization because of their, in China we have a very uh, big market. So if you want to land your, your technology, your new product into this market, it would, it though, even though it's very competitive, but the potential is very great. So, uh, I, and the other thing is the technology output. Uh, I think uh, China is doing very well. The universities, the KTOs, the knowledge transfer office getting a lot of new uh, projects, technologies into the market very effectively. So what we're trying to do is to work very closely with the major tech centers in China. And then about GBA, the Greater Bay Area. Okay, so why do we think that, uh, why do we think that this is a very uh, good opportunity? Also, we draw the same study, the Global Innovation Index. This time, they're not focusing on the innovation technology. They focus more exclusively on science and technology. So we are trying to focus on uh, re uh, universities' research output, the number of IPs, all this very competitive and deep tech, hardcore technology development. And you can see that. Uh, the cluster of Sumjian, Hong Kong, and Guangzhou actually rank second in the world, only after Tokyo and Yokohama and followed by Beijing, Seoul, uh, San Jose, and then Shanghai and Shuzhou. So you can see that we have three major technology, science and technology centers in China. And what we're trying to do is to work closely with all these centers as a development, development strategy for, for, for the whole new economy. So I think that's very important as a survey for us, that we believe that the Greater Bay Area, in terms of innovation technology, science technology is a very important area for us to focus on. So in terms of GBA, uh, actually the, to the, the total GDP is something like the economy of Canada, South Korea, so it's, it's, it's really uh, like, like a country. So I mean, we have nine cities in, in southern tip of China plus Hong Kong and Macau. And actually you can see that each city, they have their own uh, 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 strength in terms of innovation, in terms of technology and scientific output. Say for example, uh, in Guangzhou, in the capital city of Guangdong provinces, 70 to 80 percent of the best hospitals are clustered around Guangzhou. So, if, if we are talking about biotech, if we talk about med tech, medical devices, Guangzhou is a very important point for us. In terms of advanced manufacturing, we have Dongguan. So, I mean, the center of uh, advanced manufacturing and across the border of Hong Kong is Shenzhen. 
they very, are doing very well in terms of telecommunication like 5G, uh, e-commerce, and also uh, manufacturing. So I think uh, the complementary values is important for the whole GBA in terms of innovation and technology. And at this moment, we are tr talking to different cities in order to find the complementary values. Then, what are the strengths of Hong Kong as a financial center? Are we doing well in terms of innovation and technology? So actually, the value of Hong Kong in terms of technology is actually our research base. We have eight government-funded universities. Six of them are research universities, and five of them actually rank according to QS top 100 in the world, with five of them. So basically, I cannot think about another city with such a high concentration of bad research, best research universities. Uh, I go faster a bit, <laughs> five minutes. So apart from universities, we also have five government-funded research institutes across Hong Kong covering different sectors. Uh, and also, we have 16 Chinese state uh, uh, key laboratories across Hong Kong, and also six uh, engineering centers. So these clusters of, of key technologies are very important. Plus, uh, if you, uh, this morning, if you, uh, if you went to uh, Science Hall, you should visit it. One of the buildings, the whole building is reserved for a program called Inno at Hong Kong, where we are working with 28 different centers all from leading universities around the world, working together with the domestic universities. These are top-tier global research uh, outputs that we're trying to groom. So all together, you can see that the technology, uh, core technology in Hong Kong is the basic uh, 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 elements that we can put on the table to work with the GBA cities, as well as Shanghai and Beijing. So uh, this photo is taken uh, on the 30th of June this year, where President visit Hong Kong and they, he spent almost two hours uh, in Science Park. And he's amazing with the basic technologies that we are showcasing. So I think we start to find the very good complementary values. So they, uh, uh, this map showcases the development of the, uh, uh, of the border, northern part of Hong Kong, uh, with Samjian. So what we're trying to do, in, uh, this is a very uh, important government policy. In the middle circle, actually, we are trying to do is to work very closely with Samjian in terms of innovation te technology. On the left hand side, uh, uh, where uh, uh, the city of uh, uh, the district Chen Hai is located, they're very much focusing on the advanced uh, financial services, uh, modern services, as well as fintech. So we're working together with them. So zoom in a little bit, you can see that uh, uh, across the border, on the top uh, pink uh, area, which is the Samjian Innovation Technology Parks. And on the, uh, on the uh, uh, southern side, uh, 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 you can see a kidney-shaped uh, uh, loop, which we call it Lok Ma Chow Loop. We're building another science park, which is around three, four times the existing science park that you're visiting today. So the infrastructure is there. And then uh, how we do it? So uh, get, let me have a few, few minutes to go through what we're doing in science, science park. We start our business in uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2002, so it's 20 years already. So at this present moment, uh, we are supporting around over 1,000 companies uh, in the park. So we're managing in the, in the uh, R&D center, R &D center 400,000 uh, square meters of, of office and lab space. So out of this, uh, out of this uh, small campus, uh, the total working population is 18,000 people. And out of these 18,000 people, 12,000 of them are core R&D uh, uh, researchers, scientists. So Science Park is the, high, the most highly concentrated R&D centers in, in whole Hong Kong. So together in Hong Kong, we have around uh, 44,000, 40 to 44,000 R&D people. Around one fourth of them are uh, actually located in, in Science Park. Uh, we're working with over 250 leading corporations in Hong Kong, uh, sector into different uh, industry. What we're trying to promote is the concept of, co of uh, corporate innovation. We're also supporting over 700 startups. What we're promoting is entrepreneurship. So it's where the entrepreneurship meets corporate innovation, which is, which is the key. We also support company in terms of uh, 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 get, getting investment. So Cassidy, Hong Kong is a financial center, but we experience difficulties in getting early stage investment, A round or pre-A round. It's quite difficult. Uh, so uh, oh, we try a lot of things, we, we, we work with a lot of investors, and now we're very, quite happy in the past few years' time. We're able to raise, I'm a company, so our startups is very able to raise uh, over eight, 80 billion Hong Kong dollars in terms of early stage investments, which is something like a one-day transaction for Hong Kong Stock Exchange. 
So it's not a big money, but for early stage startups, pre-A rounds is a big, a massive round. We also run our own corporate venture funds, our own venture funds. So uh, it is one or it is a matching fund. So what we're able to do in the, after the close of our first uh, round of funding, we're able to secure over 16 times of multiples of private investment into the market. And then uh, what we're trying to do is to have the infrastructure, not just Science Park. Science Park is only a, a, a one of the a portion of it. We're also managing three industrial estates across uh, the territories. We'll try to revamp the whole manufacturing sector in Hong Kong. So we're promoting the concept of reindustrialization. So we have a lot of new buildings coming out very soon in the coming few years' times. In terms of program, it's not just the hardware. We're running incubation programs from different stages, all the way from the pure idea concept or basic research concept. We'll take it through to commercial Translation, translational research, as well as going to global market. In terms of market cameras, as I mentioned before, we work, we're just in Hong Kong, we're working with over 250 uh, largest corporates in different industries. We are also working with over a thousand uh, 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 venture capitals and, and, and different investors in Hong Kong. So the most challenging for us at this moment is actually the availability of uh, quality talents in terms of re uh, research and development because it's a global shortage of, of technology people. So we need to uh, attract more people to come to Hong Kong to work with, together with us. So my last one or two slides uh, focusing on our initiative in GBA. So what we're trying to do is uh, uh, to position uh, Hong Kong as an international city. So for all the programs and events that we're going to run in GBA, we'll have an international element. So we are not just working with uh, 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 domestic telecom giants, but also global ones. So in, we'll make sure that we will have international partner in each and every event. We're covering technology, but we're focusing on deep tech. It's not just you know, those, those business model, get a computer and then you can do a business. We're focusing very much on the deep techs. And then we're not able to do it alone. We need to work with the, the different sectors, no matter public or private. So we're working with various governments, uh, research institutes, universities, corporates, uh, tech ventures, as well, as well as investors and professional partners. So what we're trying to, to do is to support an ecosystem so that all these stakeholders, they will have the part to play. So that was what we're doing. So, uh, not just, uh, we're not just supporting uh, companies from Hong Kong uh, uh, to going to China, but we're also supporting companies from China through Hong Kong to engage the global market as well as to take into the institutional global capital in Hong Kong. So uh, 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 that's what we're trying to do to exploit the GV opportunities. Uh, we are going to open our first branch in Samjan very soon. Uh, it should be uh, within 60 to, to 90 days. We'll try, try to open two buildings. Uh, there's, there's a small uh, campus. It's around 32,000 square meters. So time's up. That's my last slide. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. So thanks for, uh, you know, um, uh, Peter. So uh, this is... Uh, well, actually, they do share some of the, um, I would say, uh, insights that there's really passionate questions that, you know, they would like to share with you. But I would like to ask a question, really are the questions that really from the four that I understood you give us, you know, especially, you know, uh, for, for Peter, you, you, you talk about, you know, money. That is very eye-opening. Okay, so <laughs> at least... Uh, to, from all this, I think uh, many of the participants today are actually from overseas. So how could we really, um, uh, I, I would invite all the speakers to give us a, a very short sharing that, can you give us some suggestion that really how overseas companies who are looking for opportunities in China, uh, especially the Great Bay Area, how, what should they do? What, what exactly uh, uh, the advice you would like to, to give us? Um, may I uh, invite uh, Mr. Chang to give us uh, a short sharing? Uh, I, I think that uh, you should look uh, uh, into the opportunity to develop your business in Hong Kong. The situation is that because China is so determined to a quality growth economy by adapting, reforming, opening up. Therefore, they try to establish a few, few more Hong Kong. Because of the blending of Hong Kong, it will be easier for our surface provider, especially the producer service provider, to market our surface into the China mainland. So this is one thing that you should consider. And the second is that the Chinese uh, government uh, is uh, well aware that the innovation capacity of Hong Kong is so essential 
to work closely with Shenzhen and other parts of China. Therefore, there are huge opportunity in that area. More importantly, Hong Kong is a place for headquarters of multinational and also local mainland company. So Hong Kong is now already a cluster of multinational enterprises. In Hong Kong, you can easily establish a closer relationship with a lot of enterprises all over the world. And with the facilita facilities provided by Trade Development Council and the fantastic research, I think in Hong Kong, you can get access to a lot of necessary market intelligence all over the world. So this is some uh, things I would like to give. Um, it is uh, my advice and also my PowerPoint also give you some suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Maybe Adam, you'd like to add some insights on that? I think um, depends what areas you're in, right? If you're financial services, for sure you want to be in Hong Kong and and, and for sure you want to be in Hong Kong for capital raising and advisory services and you want to target the wealth management service not only in Hong Kong, where a lot of mainland wealth is, but you also want to target the, the, the mainland wealth, right? Uh, China is opening up the wealth management license uh, in GBA, for sure. So I think financial services is no-brainer. Um, if you're in professional services, uh, as so many firms are in Hong Kong and with an office in China already, you know China also needs, continue to need those professional services, be it accounting, be it, be it legal, be it so many, in so many areas, IP, patenting, in so many areas, right? Um, clean energy is a, is a sector that uh, our, our country is very keen on in, in carbon neutral and clean energy evolves in so many areas, right? in construction in, in, in so many ways. And um, EV is another big thing. Um, healthcare, biomedicine, life science. Um, of course, you go to real economy, consumer goods, right? And maybe some of you have branded goods, consumer goods, and you definitely want to capture the, the, the local consumption market and you know, hopefully be in one of our malls or offices, right? Where we, 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 where we build the best ecosystem where you guys can really get the clusters and get the crowds and uh, really serve where uh, the customers where the demands are met. Thank you, Adam and uh, Peter. Yes, I think uh, uh, we talk about pandemic, but uh, in terms of innovation and technology, the temp temp pandemic actually helps some of our sectors. At least two sectors keep on having a, a, strong, a strong growth. The first one is uh, pandemic advances the digitalization of business for five to, ten, five to eight years' times. I don't have the statistics, but when you go out now uh, on the street, uh, three years ago, I can't see some of the elderly people, they're going to use a smartphone. But now, although almost everyone is actually getting on a smartphone, so digitization, uh, 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 the digital economy, uh, 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 product and services related to that would be one of the sectors that we're focusing on. The other sector is healthcare, obviously. You know, we get all these uh, 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 clinical trials, approvals, faster than previously. So, I mean, these two are major growing areas in terms of uh, uh, te uh, technology that we can see that. And in terms of GP, I think, uh, I do believe Hong Kong, uh, uh, as Mr. Chen said, that it's a very important position uh, 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 city for, for you to consider. Oh, we're business friendly, we get all these uh, very good uh, regulatory um, uh, environment, etc. But the important thing is that in the board, one of the slides that I'm showing that we're going to build another science park which is three, four times larger than the, the existing science park in Hong Kong. What we're trying to do is to work very closely together with some Jun Science Park. So we put the two parks together in one district. And so you, you can see that you know, we cannot you know, go to work every day with a visa getting across the border. So what we're trying to, to, to think about is uh, uh, the mobility of people, the mobility of capital, mobility of uh, products, as well as information. So I think these four flows are very important in terms of Samjun and Hong Kong development in terms of innovation and technology. And then we're radiant out to other GBA cities. So I think that would be uh, uh, my observations. Thank you. Um, so in the interest of time, let me just wrap up a bit, you know, my key takeaway. So thanks to all the speakers for your insightful sharing. And my key takeaway from today's dialogue, uh, you know, the world never stops changing, right? So we have to be agile be innovative, and they are the key attributes for business to stay resilient and enable us to navigate the ambiguity or uncertainty brought about by whether it's geopolitical tension 
or the challenges that the world is going to trans transiting into a low carbon world for a sustainable future. And the overall global economic backdrop appears to be very challenging uh, in the near term. So it is super important that for business to focus, focus on the bright spots, okay? And that, that especially those that really provide long-term opportunities. And in terms of the markets, well, since you are here, you know where are the opportunities, right? So there are huge opportunities in this region, in China, and especially the Great Bay Area. And, you know, amid all these mega trends, and Hong Kong with its very long established role as a super connector, so that's why we have our international audience here today, and also played a very uh, important gateway to China. So I, we are very confident that, you know, Hong Kong will play a key role in keep connecting, connecting the world to all these emerging opportunities in Asia. So thank you all again. Thanks. Thank you very much for all our panel speakers. Before we proceed to the next session, let's have a group photo for all the guests on stage. Would all speakers please take a step forward to the stage front. Thank you once again for the insightful sharing by all speakers. Our next session is the Young Executive Program, YEP, featuring several successful young entrepreneurs. The session will commence shortly. Please stay tuned. <laughs>